God's word is powerful, and when we study it and we learn what it says about us, it is freeing and it is liberating. And it's my prayer that all of us today are going to taste that in a new way. So let's j dive in. We've been talking about it already a little bit. 245 years ago, this weekend, in this country, something very significant happened. A group of around 60 men got together in what was the Pennsylvania State House, later known as Independence Hall, and they were tasked with a very solemn responsibility. How are they going to represent the 13 fledgling colonies who were embroiled in the heated Revolutionary War in their attempt to seek free treatment from the crown? over taxation, over representation, over all these things, right? Or should they just abandon the crown altogether? On June 7th, 1776, Richard Henry Lee, one of the founding fathers in Virginia, he proposed the Lee Resolution, which stated these colonies should become independent of the crown. The Continental Congress formed a committee of five. John Adams, Ben Franklin, Roger Sherman, Robert Livingston, and Thomas Jefferson to work on this, to draft up a document to see about this idea of independence, independence from the crown. And on June 28, 1776, their document, the Committee of Five, there they are, they presented their document to the entire Continental Congress, this idea that the new land should become free. Well, the Continental Congress, four days, they deliberated on it. And then on July 2nd, 1776, the representatives voted and the resolution for independence passed. Two days later, July 4th, 1776, in Independence Hall, 56 men signed their names on one of the most famous documents ever written in human history, the Declaration of Independence, a document that states, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. At the bottom of the document, they say, we therefore, the representatives of the United States of America and General Congress, appealing to the supreme judge of the world for the rectitude of our intentions do, in the name and by the authority of the good people of these colonies, solemnly publish and declare that these united colonies are and are right ought to be free and independent states, absolved by all allegiance to the crown. That is what happened 245 years ago, and America was free by the proclamation of the word on this paper. 2.5 million people who were living in colonies from Maine to Georgia went from being in bondage, from being in servitude, to being in freedom. A new nation, a new beginning, a new identity they were given. Now, every time I study the history of the United States, I mean, you get, we get chills, right? It is a beautiful story. We are blessed to call this nation our home. But I want to tell you something. That declaration that was signed 245 years ago was not the first declaration of independence that was given to mankind. In fact, 2,000 years ago, there was another written word that proclaimed independence to people. And it didn't just proclaim independence to people in 13 colonies, it actually proclaimed independence to people around the whole world. It didn't just proclaim independence to people who, for political freedom, it proclaimed freedom of all types. Spiritual freedom, personal freedom, social freedom. And this proclamation of independence, sadly, unlike that one penned by Jefferson, will not be eroded piece by piece with time, but rather this Declaration of Independence was spoken by the Word of God himself and will stand true through time immemorial until he returns again. So what is this Declaration of Independence, folks? I have something to tell you. We are children of the Father, and Jesus, the Son of the living God, has proclaimed freedom over all of us, not just in the United States of America, but over the entire world, we have been proclaimed to have freedom. And this morning, we're going to learn, I pray, what it means to be free indeed in Jesus. Let's bow your heads as we open up. Heavenly Father, God, we just invite your spirit into this place this morning. God, your word speaks truth, God. Your work speaks hope. And I pray that this message, God, this, I ask, God, that you will use me as your mouthpiece and that your holy word can speak to your people a truth about who we are in you. This is our prayer this morning, God. We pray it in your name and we accept by faith that you will answer it. Amen. 
In John chapter 8, Jesus had just met with a woman who was caught in adultery, and she was dragged out in front of all these people in the city in condemnation. She was about to be punished and shamed for what she had done. Now, Jesus proclaimed something over her. When Jesus saw her, he spoke truth into her heart that she was something different than what the people, the religious leaders, than what society was telling her she was. He spoke a truth into her heart that she indeed was a daughter of God who could be free from sin, that she could get up off that ground and go from that place and sin no more. She could have freedom. Now, shortly thereafter that, a collection of the Jews and the Pharisees who had seen what had happened there, they had a few words to say to Jesus. They wanted to know more about what he had just done publicly for this woman. So in John chapter 8, we just heard these words here. Jesus said to the Jews who believed him, If you abide in my word, then you are my disciples indeed. And you you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. They answered him, Well, we are Abraham's descendants. We've never been in bondage to anyone. How can you say you will be made free? Jesus answered them and said, Most assuredly, I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave to sin, ouch. And a slave to sin does not abide in the house forever, but a son abides forever. Therefore, if the son makes you free, you are free indeed. Now, I got a question for you. Who has the son made free? Everyone, right? If we believe that the word of God is truth, which I would assume most of us believe that the inspired word of God is truth, and if we believe that the Bible says, then therefore he died once for all, which is what it says, and then if we believe, therefore, when the Bible says that by his death we are given freedom, then, Ergo, everyone has been made free by the Son. So when Jesus says, who the Son has made free, you shall be free indeed. Well, that applies to everyone. Now, it's interesting because a lot of us know that, but we don't actually know that. You know, like we don't actually experience that. It's something different to know something in your head, but to experience it out in your life. So, you know, I'm going to give you an example. Tell you something else about yourself. Did you know that you are a lover of cotton candy grapes? Did you know that? You may not actually know that because you may never tasted a grape before, but I can tell you what. Once you put one of those luscious green grapes, cotton candy grapes, in your mouth and it explodes as a heavenly ball of gushing goodness, you will soon find out that you are a lover of cotton candy grapes. Now, you may have thought before, you know what, actually, I don't need those grapes because I've been eating all these other grapes, you know, these pesticide-covered, genetically modified grapes over here. I don't need cotton candy grapes, but when you go to the store and you're going to go buy yourself some of those green, organic, non-pesticide-covered cotton candy grapes, and you put that in your mouth, you're going to learn a truth about yourself. I am a lover of a cotton candy grape. You just don't know it yet because you haven't tasted it yet. I'm going to tell you something else about yourself. Did you know that you are a son or a daughter of God who is free? That is who you are. You may just not know it yet because you may not have tasted what true freedom in Jesus is like. And once you do taste it, You will never want to live any other way again because living in freedom in Jesus, that is to live indeed. That is what it means to live indeed. And it's my prayer that by the end of this message, all of us will have a taste of what that means to be free indeed in Jesus. Now, Jesus is presenting two things here, two choices, a slave to sin or free indeed. Do you see that? He's making a parallel, a contrast. Jesus often does that. Now, we we might call these identities, identities. You might identify as a slave to sin, or you might identify as being free indeed. Now, whether we realize it or not, first of all, one of those things is true, and secondly, all of us, whether we know it or not, are living and engaging in our life in one of those two identities. We may be clouded to that understanding, but we are either engaging as a son or engaging as a slave to sin, engaging in freedom or engaging in servitude and bondage. Now, if you've been in a Christian for any length of time, this is not a new concept, right? We're very familiar with, with this idea. And why are we familiar with this? Because the Bible talks a lot about this. The Bible talks a lot. I want you to open up your Bibles to Romans 6. And we're just going to take a quick perusal here through Romans 6 because Paul talks about this. And we're going to put all the pieces together. So open up your Bible, Romans 6, chapter 1. We're just going to kind of go through some verses here. Paul says, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who have what? Died to sin live any longer in it. All right, so Paul is opening up this argument. You guys have died to sin, all right? Do you not know that as many of you as were baptized in Christ Jesus, you were baptized into his death? Therefore, you were buried with him through baptism into death, and then Christ was raised from the dead. Now, if we drop down a little bit more, verse 7, I'm in Romans 6, verse 7. He who has died has been freed from what? 
Sin, we see it right there. And if we've died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. Okay, so Paul was talking here about dying to sin. And then you can see down here in verse 12, don't let sin reign in your mortal bodies, all these things. Later on in Romans 6, verse 15, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin? No, you shouldn't continue in sin. Verse 20, for when you were slaves to sin, you were free in regard to righteousness, but now you have been set free from sin. Okay, are we seeing a pattern here? Now, I know we're kind of going through this fast. That's okay. Go back and read Romans 6, verse by verse later today. We're gonna make a point. What is Paul saying in Romans 6 we are free from? Sin. We're free from sin, okay? We all see that? That's kind of scattered all the way through there. Free from sin, died from sin, you're no longer bound to sin. All right, that's Romans 6. Romans 7, keep your Bible open, keep looking here. So then he says here, do you not know, brethren, I speak of those who know the what? The law. Ooh, now we got a new thing we're talking about. The law. For the law has dominion over a man as long as he lives. And then he gives this analogy about a woman and a husband who's married, and then when her husband dies, she's freed from the law. We see that here. And then, see later on in seven, what shall we say then? Is the law sin? No, I wouldn't have known sin without the law. But then he starts coming down here a little bit later. He says, um, I was once alive without the law, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. So now we're talking about he's dying from the law. He's free from the law. Okay, so we see another parallel here. Romans 6, Paul says, I'm free from sin. Romans 7, Paul says, you're free from the law. Now, obviously, we know these things are connected. Now, Romans 8. Romans 8. Keep your Bible turning here. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from what? The law of sin and death. Okay, what did we just see there? We just saw now that the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set us free from two things, the law and the sin. Now, those are the exact two things Jesus just told us we were free from, the law in Romans 7 and from sin in Romans 6. We see that. And then he goes on here, verse 4, that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who are not walking according to the flesh but according to the spirit. If you go all the way down through Romans 8, you're going to start seeing a word come up a lot Verse nine, you are not of the flesh, but you are in the spirit. Indeed, the spirit of God dwells in you. If anyone doesn't have the spirit of Christ, he's not his. If Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit of life because of righteousness. Okay, what are we seeing here? Free from sin, free from the law, and the people who are, who are free of those things are what? They are living in the spirit, all right? Pretty clear, right? And again, I encourage you, go back to Romans 6, 7, 8 later on today. Now, what we see here, Jesus just told us. Jesus just told us, number one, we're either slaves to sin or we've been made free from the Son, okay? Now, Paul just says when we're free, we're free from sin and the law. And the other thing he just told us was that those people who are free from sin and the law are people who are living in the Spirit. Make sense? We all together so far? Okay, so what does that mean? What does that mean to be free from the sin and from sin and the law? Because really, that must be an important thing, right? The Bible's making a big deal about it. Again, if you've been a Christian for any length of time, you probably know some of this. We're gonna take a look at the basics of it, and then we're really gonna take a look at it. So what does it mean to be free from the law and sin? Well, what is the law? What does the law do? These are verses we know very well. Romans 3, for by the law there is the knowledge of sin. Okay, so the law is identifying something. The law points out sin. Do we see that? And then in Romans 7, we just read this. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? No, on the contrary, I wouldn't have known it without the law, okay? So the law is pretty much telling us what sin is. It's identifying it. I didn't know it was wrong to drive 100 miles an hour on Montana Avenue until the sign told me it was only 35, right? And I'm like, oh, okay, I'm sinning. I'm breaking the law, right? So it's identifying transgression. Now, what is the result of that? Romans 2.12, for as many have been sinned in the law will be what? Judged by the law. Uh-oh, now I gotta make a court date with the county because I went 100 in Montana Avenue and I broke the law and I need to be judged for that, right? So if we are free from that, we're free from judgment because we're free from the law. What about sin? Oh, here we go. So the law directly leads to judgment. Having the law in your life leads to judgment and if we're free from that, we're free from that. Now. A question, what are some other things that might exist in a person's life living under a law, knowing that there's a law that applies to you, that is watching you, that's guarding you? I think there are some indirect effects. You might live in fear. 
Fear that you're going to break the law. Fear that you're not going to break the law. Worry. Am I breaking the law today? Confusion. What exactly is the law? Guilt, shame, condemnation when you do break the law. Self-righteousness. I keep the law so well. I'm so good. Do you see this? There's a lot of other effects that occur if we're living under the law. Now, sin. What about sin? We know what this is. First John, whoever commits sin has transgressed the law because sin is the transgression of the law. Sin is lawlessness. So that's what it is. What are the results of that? The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God's eternal life. So if we say then, all right, okay, I'm free from sin. What are the effects of sin? The direct consequence of sin is death. Do we see that? We know that. What are some indirect consequences of sin? Well, that would be a very big list indeed, would it not? If sin exists and we're under sin, everything bad in the world is an indirect consequence of sin. Follow me? Like sadness, guilt, shame, brokenness, division, hopelessness, immorality, confusion. You put your, whatever your experience is with sin, you put it on that list because that is an indirect effect of sin. And that is another consequence of living under sin. Okay. Now, none of this is like groundbreaking to us. We're Christians. We've known this. We've known this. So, when we are made free from the law and sin, we are therefore made free from judgment and death. And therefore we're made free from all the other indirect consequences of it. Now that's good news, right? That's good news. Because every one of us has things on this list that we are living with. I have a question for you. How many of you know this is true intellectually? You know this is true. You know this is what the Bible says, right? How many of you experience this? every day of your life. Freedom from this. There's a disconnect there. Why is that? Does God, do you believe God wants us to experience true freedom? Would that be God's will? Interesting, interesting. It's a different thing to just know something than to experience it. Now, in fact, I would go so far as to say this, not only are too many Christians, too many of us in this room, not experiencing this, we're experiencing the exact opposite of it. Where actually our day-to-day life is defined by these things. We wake up and we live with guilt and shame and condemnation and sadness and hopelessness and brokenness and all of the things, that is what we're living with every day. Is that what the Christian life is supposed to be about? Or is the Christian life supposed to be making you free of those things? The Bible, the word of God, tells you you're supposed to be free and you can be free of those things. So why are we not free? When we know something and we can go to church our whole life learning something, where's the disconnect? Why isn't it happening? That is what we're going to get into today. You see, either the Bible is true or it's a bunch of hogwash. It's a bunch of false promises. It's a bunch of fables and a bunch of lies promising things that aren't really attainable by human beings or there's something keeping us from experiencing true freedom in Christ. Now Jesus said, Jesus said something in this verse. Let's go back to the verse, because Jesus has some answers. Jesus said to the Jews, if you shall abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Okay, the truth shall make you free. Now, later on he says, therefore if the Son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. Okay, so Jesus just identified two things that are going to make us free. What are the two things that can make us free? Truth and the Son, right? Truth and the Son. That's Jesus' word saying that. Okay, so if we're gonna experience freedom, we're gonna experience freedom through those two things. So what are those two things? The truth, the truth about what? Now, at the very beginning of the sermon, I said this is a contrast between two identities, right? Two identities. You're either a slave to sin or you're living free in Christ. And the truth shall set you free. The truth about your true identity. The truth about who God is, the truth about who you are, and the truth about the world he created. That truth can set you free. Now, I have a question for you. If Jesus says the truth shall set you free, does it not reason to follow then that an untruth or a lie could be keeping you from experiencing freedom? Does that make sense? Right? Could it be, could it be that we are believing a lie about our identity? about who we are, and that lie is preventing us from experiencing true freedom in Christ, even though we might intellectually know that the Bible says we don't experience it day to day because we're believing a lie, and Jesus says, I'm gonna give you the truth, and the truth will set you free. If that's true, what are those lies? What are those lies? Now, this is where where it's gonna get real. 
It's going to get real. So, the law. We identified earlier in our sermon that the law and sin are the two things we're free from. Now, what exactly is the law? Is, 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 is the law literally just to identify sin? Is that all it is? Or is it something more than that? I'm going to suggest to you the law is something a lot more than that. The law is a reflection of God's perfect character, of who he is, and not just who he is, but it is a reflection, therefore, of the reality of the world that God created. Because when God created the world, his imprint is on the world. His imprint, his character qualities, exist in nature, in creation, in all of the being of the world because he's the creator. So therefore, if the law is a reflection of God's perfect character, it is therefore a reflection of the reality of the world that he created. Did you know there are verses in the Bible that state that God is good, just, holy, eternal, love, loving, peaceful, truth, hope, perfect, sure, pure, and righteous? Did you know there are verses in the Bible that say the law of God is good, just, holy, eternal, love, peace, truth, hope, perfect, sure, pure, and righteous? So the law of God is said to be the same thing as God. It's a reflection of the character of God. Now, it's interesting. The law is written in an interesting way, though. It's written in such a way as to highlight the inverse or the opposite of God's character and the reality of the universe that he created, and in doing so, act as a warning of how we, as free beings occupying this reality, may live in violation of his character and the reality he created. Are you following me? So essentially, we are image bearers of Christ. This is why things in the law are written as, you shall not do blank. What does that mean? Because essentially, if you do blank, you will be behaving in the exact opposite way, the exact opposite way of who God is and what reality is and of who you are in him because you were created in his image. This is like, this is, let me just give you like a really kind of a cheesy example, but it'll kind of make sense. Let's say that you are a diehard Seattle Seahawks fan. Like that is who you are. You identify as being a Seattle Seahawks fan, okay? Everything about your reality is that the Seattle Seahawks are the best team in all of the world and no one else even comes close to that. Now you've got children in your home, okay? And you might make a law in your home that says a few things. You shall not ever pay allegiance to the Denver Broncos. You shall not covet after the Denver Broncos team and their players. You shall not ever commit murder to the Seattle Seahawks players. You shall not do this and that. Why? Because essentially the reality of your world is such that the Seattle Seahawks are the very best team in the world. And any thought that runs contrary to that or behavior in alignment with that is opposition to reality, right? Do you see that? So your law that you might set for your children is essentially a reflection of the reality that exists that you created. All right, now, it is the same and true with God. The law and the commandments reflect the world of who he is by warning against specific ways in which human beings can believe something about God that is not true, believe a lie, and then behave and act in accordance with that false belief. Let me show you what this is. God is the life giver. You shall not murder. God is sovereign. You shall have no other gods before me. God is truth. You shall not lie. God is the creator and God values time spent with his creation. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy for in six days he created the Sabbath, the world. God is giving and generous. You shall not covet. God is holy. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. God is the author and creator of marriage, a sanctified union between human beings. You shall not commit adultery. Honor your father and mother. Are you seeing the connection there? Are you seeing how the law actually identifies the character of God? and is identifying the reality of the world that he created that operates in accordance with those laws. And how do I, can I say that? Well, here we go. So essentially, the law reveals the truth. The law reveals the truth. It identifies the character of God, who God is, and we, as being image bearers of God, it reveals the character of his children, us. And lastly, it reveals the reality of the world of his creation because the world was created by God and all of creation is infused with his, with, um, his character is infused in all creation. I can say that with confidence because the Bible says right here in Romans 1, the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature are clearly seen in nature, being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. Psalm, the heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the heavens of the earth, the heavens of his, her work of his hands. Okay, so this is what the law actually does. It does more than just identify sin. What it really does is actually identify truth about who God is, who his character is, and who are we and created in his image, and what is the creation and the reality of the world that he made. 
That's actually powerful. Now, what about sin? What about sin? We've identified already that sin is the transgression of the law, right? Is the transgression of the law or lawlessness. So sin is doing the things the law said not to do. It's acting out in violation of what the law said, stealing, lying, coveting. Okay, now stay with me here. If we just determined that a person who does those things is living and engaging with the world in such a way that violates the reality of who God is, of who God made them to be, and the very nature of the world around them. That is violating the law. And sin, the act, is carrying that out. We might say it like this. Sin, by violating the law, is violating the truth, or true reality. The truth of who God is, the truth of who you are, and the truth of what the world is. Sin, violating the law, is living or acting and behaving in accordance, therefore, with a false reality. It's actually not what God made it to be. You might say sin is living in accordance with a lie. A lie, interesting. Not too long ago, we talked about a lie keeping us from knowing the truth and being free. Let me give you an example of this. I think it's gonna really make this understandable. You live in Montana, right? We all live in Montana, right? Okay. So, if I was God, and if I made Montana and I put my children there, I might give my children a law that says, you're in Montana, you shall not dress like you live in Alaska. Now, now, why would I give you that law? Well, number one, first of all, the reality is you live in Montana, okay? And number two, the other reason I would give you that law is because if you choose not to believe that reality that you live in Montana and choose instead to believe a different reality that you live in Alaska, you're going to start acting and behaving in a way that will lead to negative consequences, agreed? You're gonna start wearing clothes that are gonna burn you out. It's 100 degrees out there. Okay, are you following me? Now, why will I give you that law? Is it because I hate you and I want to control you and I want to just, you know, control your life? No, 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 no. It's because I love you and I know the consequences of what living and engaging in the world is, living in a false reality. Okay. Now, I, that's right, because I essentially told my, let's say I tell my children that if you live in Montana, if you, in, if you think that you're living in Alaska, if you, in, how can I say this? Essentially, if you're living in Montana, but you think that you're actually living in Alaska, you will then start to behave in ways that will lead to negative consequences. Okay, now, what if there was an enemy? What if there was an enemy who came along, came along, and you're living your life here in Montana, and he tells you, hey, you know what? You're actually not in Montana. That, that, that thing that your father told you is actually full of lies. That's not true because you're actually in Alaska. That's who you are, okay? So, because, guess what? That father, he lied to you because he doesn't want you to experience the true goodness of living in Alaska because you're actually living in Alaska, even though the reality is you're living in Montana. Okay, so, you, you hear a lie. And this enemy might tell you, this is actually my territory. I actually own this territory. This territory is Alaska. All you gotta do is start acting and behaving in such a way as if you live in Alaska. And then, and then you will be able to reap the benefits of that. So an enemy comes and tells you that and lies to you. Now, you might look up and say, you know what, actually this looks like Montana. This looks like what the father told me it was. But you know what, the enemy keeps lying to you and he keeps telling you and he keeps telling you, you know, no, you're actually not. He has an agenda. He wants you to believe his lie because he knows that if you believe his lie, you will then engage in a way that will lead to damage. All right, so what do you do? After you hear this over and over and over again, and you stop focusing less on what I, your father, told you and what the enemy's telling you, you end up going to REI and you end up buying a giant triple parka thing and you end up buying double insulated pants and you end up buying a hat and you end up buying all these things. You start going outside wearing all that because that's what you were told. Are you following me? I know it's a cheesy example, but it follows. It has a point. So you go outside them and what do you see? You see a bunch of other people wearing parkas in Montana because 100 degrees, because a bunch of other people have been told the same lie and they're engaging with the same reality. They all think it's Alaska. And you know, as you're wearing that parka, as you're going through your life, it starts to get hot. You start to suffer a little bit. You're like, oh man, is it actually? Am I wrong? 
maybe, maybe, maybe what God told me is true, but no, 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 no. The enemy comes down because you just need a little air conditioning. You just need some more water. You need this. You keep hearing the lies, hearing the lies. You keep acting in accordance to that. But then eventually it starts to get more suppressive and you start to struggle wearing that parka in 100 degree heat in Montana because that's what you were told. Interesting. And then eventually, you start to the point where you start to struggle to keep living. And you ask yourself the question, did I make a mistake? Is what God told me, was, it act, was that true? Or is it what the enemy, was it what he told me? Is that true? I want to take this parka off. I don't want to deal with this anymore. I don't want to live this way because this is suppressive. I'm struggling. I'm, 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 I'm burdened with this, okay? But the enemy tells you, <laughs> you can't take it off because once you put that on, you can never take that back off again. Once you've sinned, you're always a sinner. You'll never go back to being anything less than a sinner. Meanwhile, you're struggling. It's feeling heavy. You're fighting with it. Some days, you start to take part of it off, you get an arm out, and then the enemy lies, and you put your arm back in. You're struggling wearing that, believing the lie. You're struggling with sin. Meanwhile, up in heaven, the Father's looking down at you, saying, my child, it's all a lie. That Parker was never meant for you. That's never what I intended for you. Let me take that off of you. Let me free you. But the enemy keeps telling you, you cannot be freed. You cannot live any other way because his voice, the Father's voice, is being crowded out by the enemy clamoring in your ear, telling you a bunch of lies about who you are and the world that you live in. Until one day you can't take it anymore and you die from heat stroke. You die wearing that. All that stuff you bought because you were told you were in Alaska, not in Montana. Now, why did you die? Did you die because the father said you violated the law and you're gonna punish you for your actions? Or did you die because an enemy told you that you are not who you say you are, that you are not a citizen of where you actually say, that you, be that you believed a lie and the consequences of that lie led to death? Meanwhile, in heaven, the father was looking down, the father who made you, who was in agony saying, I told you, my child, I told you specifically in my law, do not believe that you live in Alaska, because I know if you do, this is the result. Out of his love, he gave a law to you. Does that make sense, you following? This is what sin is. Sin is living in accordance to a lie, a lie. A lie of the truth of who God is. It misrepresents God's character. A truth about who we are, it misrepresents who we are in the eyes of God and the reality of the world that we actually live in. And when we walk in accordance with this lie and behave and engage, we are violating the natural laws of the reality, which therefore will lead to consequences of that and will lead to bondage. And guess what happens? When we act this way, there's another message the enemy tells us. You sinned, you're a sinner. You can't be anything other than a sinner because you are defined by what you do. You are defined by what you have done. You are defined by your mistakes. You are guilty, you are condemned, you are under shame. That is who you are. That is the message we get from the enemy when we are under sin. So, when we are free from sin, and when we are free from the law, Jesus said, the truth shall set you free. So if this is a lie, I have a question for you. What is the truth? What is the truth? The truth. Sin is predicated, just right, sin is predicated on a lie, a lie about God, a lie about you, and a lie about the world. And when you sin, the devil tells you another lie, that your identity is that of a sinner. Now, Jesus has a better word, because Jesus said, whoever commits sin is a slave to sin. Do you see that? Whoever commits sin, a person who is living in alignment with the lie, who's the false reality that the devil has set up to deceive you and trick you, but you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Okay, so what is the truth then? What is the truth about who we are? Because in the truth about who we are is the ticket to freedom, truly understanding freedom. I want you to see this. Galatians 4, 3 through 7. Even so, we, when we were children, we were in bondage. We were living under the weight of sin. We were in bondage. But under the elements of the world. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent his forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were what? Under the law, under the condemnation, under the, the shame of sin. Now look at what Galatians says. So that we might receive the adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. Therefore, you are no longer a slave to sin. 
But you are a son, and if you are a son, then you are an heir of God through Christ. Do you see a different identity in what the word of God says about you than what the lies of the enemy says about you? Do you see that? God's word, the truth of God, preaches hope into our lives. Now, let's see here, Galatians 3. This is not just one verse. For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. As many of you have been baptized into Christ, you've put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither slave nor free. You are all one in Christ. If you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seeds and heirs according to the promise. This is who we are according to the word of God. John 1, Jesus said it, but as many of you received him, to then he became the right to become what? Children of God. We're children of God. To those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, not of the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us, that we should be called children of God. Therefore, the world does not know us because it did not know him, beloved. Now we are children of God. Now look at what it says here in 1 John. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. Whoever commits sin commits lawlessness. All right, we've been talking about that. And sin is lawlessness. And you know that he was manifested to take away our sins because in him is no sin. In Jesus, the lie, the false reality cannot exist. It doesn't exist because Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And understanding the truth of who he is and who we are in him frees us from falling for the lies of the enemy. Little children, let no one deceive you. The enemy, from the beginning of time, has been telling humanity lies about who God is and about who we are. And it is believing and walking in accordance with those lies that lead us, that lead us to fall when we have already been made free. He who practices righteousness is righteous as as he is righteous. He who sins is of the devil, for the devil is sin from the beginning. But whoever has been born of God does not sin, for his seed remains in him and he cannot sin. Once we understand the true nature of sin and the true nature of who we are, we are freed from that. And this is why Paul says in Romans, I don't even want to go do those things again because that is not who I am. Why would I go back and engage in a way in sin when that is not who I am? From the moment I've been born, I've been free from sin. And even though I believed a lie my whole life and thought I had to engage in this way, I don't because I've been free. Whoever has been born of God does not sin for his seed remains in him and he cannot sin. What did it say in the Genesis? That we were created in his image. The image of God, he created the male and female. What did it say about our domain? We are citizens of heaven. We're citizens of heaven. So the last one here, Romans 8. Back to where we started. Romans 8. There is therefore now, Romans 8, 1, no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who are not walking according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Are you seeing it? If we understand our true identity, you're not under condemnation anymore. You're not under sin. You're not under shame. You're not under guilt because you're in Christ Jesus. The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and of death. What the law could not do in that it was weak to the flesh, God did by sending his son in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin. Now the end of Romans 8, if you're in your Bibles, just read this with me. Verse 12. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. Are you in bondage to the flesh? Are you in bondage to your carnal desires? Are you in bondage to your sinful proclivities that the devil tells you that you have, that he tells you that you were created to be? No, you're not a debtor to the flesh. You are to live or to live according to the flesh because if you live according to the flesh, you will die. Not because God wants you to die but because that is the consequence of living and engaging with the world with a false reality. It leads to death. But, but, if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For as many are led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God, sons and daughters of God. You did not receive the spirit of bondage to fear. We were not born slaves we were not born supposed to be fearing we were born sons and daughters of god and the enemy has lied to us you did not receive a spirit of bondage to fear but you received a spirit of adoption by whom we cry out abba father 
children of the Most High God, the Holy Spirit himself bears witness and testimony that you and I today are children of God. That is who we are. Children of God, free in him. And if we are children, then what does it say? We are heirs with Christ. When the devil tells you you are nothing more than a sinner, you can't take that parka off, you are chained to those things, it is a lie. It is a lie that Jesus did away with on the cross when he set us free. Amen? Heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If indeed we suffer with him, then we will be glorified together. Glorified together. So, so, who are you? Who are you? Who am I? What is the truth of the word of God that can set us free? You are, every person here, from the moment you were created and knitted in the, in the womb, you are a beloved son and da- or daughter of, God, of the Most High God, the creator of the universe. You were created in his perfect image. You are a citizen of heaven, not of earth. You are redeemed and defined by what Jesus has done, not by what we have done. Amen? <laughs> Amen? And you have been freed from sin and the law before you were even born. Now, friends, this is not Ryan Turner which talking. This is the word of God talking. Do you believe the word? Do you believe the word? How do you claim freedom in your life? How do you live and experience freedom by believing the word of God? And I know you might say, Ryan, I don't feel free. I don't feel free. I have sin, you know? <laughs> I sin, I mess up. In 2 Corinthians, it says, we walk by faith, not by sight. It says that we fix our eyes on not what is seen, but is unseen, because what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. What are we gonna believe? Because at the end of the day, we all believe something about ourselves. There is an enemy out there lying to us, lying to all humanity about who you are, And that lie keeps you and I in bondage. Do you see it? It keeps us as slaves. But we have a father, a redeemer, who tells us a different story, who has a better word, who tells us who we are. And walking in faith and accepting that identity gives us freedom. Believing the word over your life, having faith that what God says about you is true is actually true. When Noah received a word from the father that it was gonna rain, It had never rained on earth, but he believed the word and and God's word came true. When when Moses received a word from the Father, you're gonna go lead these people out. He hadn't seen that, but he believed the word in faith and it came true. When Abraham received a word from the Father, I will provide a sacrifice. I will make you a father of a nation. He hadn't seen that yet, but he believed the word and God's word came true. So, friends, do you believe the word about who you are in God? because it's the truth. And if you start to walk in accepting this identity, your life will be transformed. Waking up every morning saying, God, I'm a son and daughter. I'm your son or daughter. I am no longer a slave to sin because you freed me from that. Because of your spirit living inside of me, I'm no longer in bondage to these things, to this guilt, to this shame to these broken relationships, to these pains, to these hurts, to whatever the effects of sin are in your life, Jesus has set you free. What has been purchased cannot be lost. There is not a return receipt on Jesus' sacrifice. He died once for all. And we can choose to either claim by faith our true identity and walk in it, believe the word over your life, believe that he says you are who you say you are, and you will find freedom indeed. Is that your prayer, friends? Is that a way that you would want to live? That can start today, because let me tell you what, you've been free before you were even formed. What Jesus did on Calvary freed us all then and there. And the lies of the enemy cannot hold us in bondage any longer if we live in the truth of what God's word says about us. It's my prayer, it's my prayer that we all can walk into this true identity in Christ. Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, God, 
We are in awe of what you have done, Lord. You have set us free by your word, God, and we recognize now we have been told so many lies by the enemy our whole lives. What our worth is, what our value is, what our identity is, what our opportunities are, what our potential is, what we can achieve, what we can't do. God, your word has told us that we are your children and that we are heirs to your throne to be glorified with you, God. We invite your spirit in to our hearts now. Give us faith, God. I pray that every person who hears these words can have holy faith from your spirit to believe the truth of these words over their life. The enemy is trying to drag us down with lies, but God, he has no power because you've defeated him. May we walk by faith, not by sight. This is our prayer, Lord. We love you, and we claim an identity as your children in freedom. In your holy name, Jesus, amen.